Okay, uh, we're going to start our next session. It's the in kernel fast path performance for containers running telecom workloads. Um, we have some of the presenters online. I see Nishant. Nishant, if you're online, do you want to introduce yourself and your co presenters? Yeah. Uh, hey, hey, everyone. My name is Nishant. Uh, today, I will be playing a pre recorded video of my talk. Uh, about the in kernel performance of a telecom workload. I have um, another speaker, another colleague of mine, Michal Kubiak. He, uh, just as an aside, could he be added as a speaker as well? He's unable to join in as a speaker. Thank you. Okay, so we're gonna do a pre-recorded video, um, just like the previous one, we're gonna run through. Nishant is online if you have questions. Ask for the mic, you can interrupt and we can take questions. If not, wait till the end and we'll address them then. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon to everyone. Today I'll be speaking about in kernel fast path performance for containers running telecom workloads. My name is Nishant Shamkumar. I've been working on this project with my colleagues at Intel, Piotr Rajinsky, Dave Kremens, Mikhail Kubiak, and Ashok Sundarajan. The way the talk is structured, I'll initially be talking about the virtualization of telecom network functions. And then I'll speak about how containers are implemented and why we require network virtualization. And then I'll go a bit into how our solution tries to solve the issues, make an introduction to our use case, our test use case. And from there, I'll explain the test setup and the results that we get, and I'll conclude finally. To start off, the telco virtual network functions. On the left-hand side, this is the traditional telecom workload. It's a fixed function appliance which means we have a special purpose hardware on top of which runs proprietary operating systems and other proprietary management software, and on top of which runs the actual telecom workload or the network function. The fixed function is a tightly integrated stack, and this creates vendor lock-in. Vendor lock-in and a lack of innovation and difficulty in flexibility in adding or removing features. Thus, the move has been to go from the left-hand side of fixed function appliances to the right-hand side, which is opening up the telecom workload stack. This, on the right-hand side, we use commodity hardware, such as general purpose processors, the x86, open source software, which runs on top of it, and virtualization of the network function workload. The benefit of this is there's a lot of competition on the hardware space, each vendor has their own features that they like to provide, and that helps in innovation. The open source software brings together, helps in collaboration and mainly in standardization of technology. And the virtualization helps in improving flexibility because now you can have a network function that starts up quickly, can be removed quickly, scaled up and scaled down. This flexibility is quite important. The two ways of virtualizing a network function are through containers and virtual machines. The trend has been to move from virtual machines to containers mainly because containers are more lightweight. They rely on the kernel to create the sandboxed environment. The gaps that our work is trying to fill is to have a solution that can allow for fast path performance but should maintain scalability. So if we have a lot of containers, our solution should be able to scale with it. And the main point is we want to minimize system integration overhead. In this respect, we try to find a solution that has an in-kernel support. It is supported by the kernel. It does not entirely bypass the kernel and it cooperates when it works with the kernel. We do this mainly to reduce the cost of ownership. When we give a uh, uh, the end user, a tel uh, Linux box, we want the solution to work out of the box without any requirement for any third party integration. So how are containers 
enabled in the Linux kernel. There are two main implementations that is used by the kernel. Those are namespaces and C groups. A namespace is when a process is inside a namespace, they're limiting the view of the process. It's a lot like a horse blinder. It reduces the world view. But even if a horse has a horse blinder, it can still move sideways and do other things. As similarly, processes can also make use of extra CPUs. They can use a lot of memory. A rogue process could even create fork bombs and saturate the PID namespace. To avoid this, there is the concept of C groups, which takes a bunch of processes and puts them in a group and the total group has a resource limit. So the containers use two main ideas, namespaces for isolation and C groups for resource control. Within namespaces, there are other subdivisions, PID namespace, mount namespace, network namespace, etc. The one we'll be focusing on today is network namespace for the stock. On the left, when a, uh, uh, by default, a system comes up with a root namespace or default namespace. When a container is created and spun up, it has its own namespace. In this case, NS1 and NS2. What is the difference between each of these namespaces? Each namespace gets its own route and arc tables. It gets its own net filter rules. It also has its own ephemeral ports. So for example, if I have an application over here, a web application that's listening on port 80, and I have another web application on this namespace listening on port 80, there will be no conflict because each of them have their own unique ephemeral ports. The thing is, if we have a single physical interface, the only way for a network namespace within a container to use the network connectivity is either to break the isolation or for the physical interface to move into this network namespace, but that prevents scalability. As a result, containers, in order to do the networking, which is integral, it needs network virtualization. Network virtualization can be implemented in software. There are examples of these are, some of the internal examples are L2 Bridge, Mac VLAN, IP VLAN, so take the case of the L2 bridge. We have the container, the same figure as before, a root namespace for the host, NS1 and NS2 for the two containers. They have the virtual interfaces or VETH that is connected to the bridge. If there's an application similar to the previous example of a web application listening on port 80, there needs to be a port mapping for the application from this interface IP address, this port number 80, to the physical interface IP address and port number, say for example, 10,000. Similarly over here, port number interface IP 80 to interface IP address and probably 11,000 port. So for example, a packet comes in to this physical interface with a destination port of 10,000. It hits the net filter rules on the host namespace stack. It does a port address translation the routing table then sends it to the L2 bridge subnet. And over here, the bridge does a table lookup and routes the packet to the appropriate container. As can be seen, we are actually using CPU cycles in net filter rule matching and bridge table lookups in order to route the packet. Similarly, with the case of Mac VLAN groups, in a Mac VLAN group, you need a base device, which generally happens to be a physical interface device. Mac VLAN virtual interfaces can be created and attached to the Mac VLAN group. The way this works is it does not require any port mapping. As a result, we do save CPU cycles that would otherwise have been spent on net filter rules. Instead, the packet comes in, it's matched in a table against the valid MAC addresses within the group. If it does find a valid MAC address, it routes it to the appropriate interface. From here, it moves up to the Linux traditional Linux network stack. In both cases, CPU cycles being spent on routing the packet rather than processing the packet. The, our first part of the solution is to actually eliminate the software virtualization, network virtualization. For this, we use hardware IO virtualization, specifically SRIOV. How does this work? 
if this is a network interface card, it has a set of resources. We then break up the set of resources into separate groups. In this example, it's like three Q pairs is one group. This group gets its own PCI address. It gets its own PCI configuration space and its own interrupts. From the perspective of the host system, this group or what is called a virtual function is its own physical device. And it has an interface associated with it and a driver associated with it. This interface can now be moved into a container space. So here you can see the scalability of the SRIOV. If you have, depending on the number of resources and how it is grouped, we can have a, a number of VFs and each VF can be assigned to a different container. For example, in this case, the container with NS2 namespace is able to directly, it does not require any software code in order to route the packets to this container namespace. It's directly communicating with the hardware resource. However, we still have, once the packet reaches the interface, it still has to send it up to the traditional Linux network stack. For high throughput workloads, this becomes a bottleneck, especially the packet copy operation. So this is the second part of our solution, is to use AFXTP. What is AFXTP? It is a high performing network data path that works in conjunction with a kernel. That is the kernel supports the functionality for doing AFXTP operations, but it does bypass the network stack at a certain point. So let me explain AFXTP by comparing it with a traditional network stack. In a traditional network stack, a packet comes in, the driver picks up the packet, it creates an SK buff structure, which is the data structure that the Linux kernel subsystem network stack understands. It then passes it up the network stack to the different subsystems, the traffic class subsystem, the IP subsystem with the different net filter hook points, and then to the layer four subsystem, the TCP UDP. From here, the packet is sent to the socket buffer and then copied over from kernel space to user space, where the user space application consumes the packet. With an AFXTP, three main points I want to focus on. First, if you see over here, it's AFINet, which is a traditional internet working family. AFXTP has its own socket family called AFXTP. This socket, when it gets created, it binds itself to a specific hardware queue. Second, is the eBPF program that runs as part of the network data path immediately after the driver picks up the packet. This is the earliest point where an eBPF logic can be run on a packet. This point is called XDP or express data path. The XDP can create a bunch of decisions. It can either drop the packet, it can decide I don't want the packet and drop it from the system. It can pass the packet, in which case it sends it, it creates an SK buff and sends it up like a traditional network stack. Or it could do an XDP redirect operation. In an XDP redirect operation, the packet is looked at, at a table, a hash table, and a, the user space socket is one of the entries. So it copies the packet to that specific user space. The third point is the UMEM. The UMEM is a user space memory a user space application requests some memory, a virtually contiguous block of memory. This memory in turn is divided into 2K or 4K blocks, which are called frames. And the frame is the basic unit in an AFXTP operation. So if you're looking at an example over here for AFXTP, a packet comes in, the driver picks up the raw packet. Before it creates an SK buff structure, it sends the packet to the XTP program. The XTP program can now make a decision. If it decides to redirect the packet to the application, the, the program then copies the packet from the kernel space to the user space. This copying of the packet is CPU intensive and can degrade the performance. As a result, our focus is to eliminate this packet copying. Thus, we focus on AFXTP zero copy support in an IAVF driver. So how does zero copy work in AFXTP? 
Most of the components I've already mentioned, the socket file descriptor, which starts and binds itself to a specific queue. In this example, Q0, the user memory area, the driver with the XTP program. The new section are the four rings. The rings are used to transfer control of the frame from either the user space to the kernel space and from kernel space back to the user space. As I said earlier, the frame is the basic unit and the rings are used to transfer the ownership of this frame between the two uh, spaces. I'll show an example for an Rx flow of how zero copy works. The user space application creates a socket, binds itself to a, so to a hardware queue. It now looks at its UMEM area and sees which are the free frames. If it finds a free frame, it takes the address of the frame, which is going to be an offset address from the base and takes that address and puts it into the descriptor of the fill ring. At this point, the control of the frame has been given to the kernel. The driver, when it is loaded in, is then, it peeks into the fill ring, looks at the frame address, converts this frame address into a bus address and programs the hardware descriptor in the queue. At this point, a packet comes in, it hits the queue, a DMA operation is initiated, the packet now is copied, it's, it's sent, it's sent over to the frame in user space. Once the DMA operation is complete, it raises an IR queue to the CPU. The CPU schedules the driver. At this point, the driver still has ownership of the frame. It can reference it. It sends the reference to the XTP program. The XTP program uses, runs a logic on the packet and makes a decision. If the decision is to redirect the packet, the, the, kernel, the kernel space program then updates the Rx ring with the address of the frame. The user space application is listening, is peeking into the Rx ring. When it finds a descriptor, a valid descriptor, it reads the descriptor, reads the address that the descriptor is pointing to, the frame address, goes to the frame and then picks up the packet in order to be consumed by the application. There are a couple of things I want to focus on here. There is at no point a packet copy from kernel space to user space. It relies on the network interface card to DMA the packet directly into the user space memory. Second, there is a separation of concern. The user space is not tasked with programming the hardware descriptor. Instead, it is the kernel space that programs the hardware descriptor. It takes control of interacting with hardware devices. And this is important because it improves system security. Third, even though the socket file descriptor for a fast path operation makes use of this queue, there are other queue pairs that are, that are available and we can have control packets such as ICMP packets and ARP packets that get in over here and can be, can be passed up to the network stack, the traditional Linux network stack for processing. Thus, we are able to reuse the kernel code that already exists. Now I wanna give a brief mention of our test use case. For this, I will introduce a tel how a telecom network is designed. The main idea behind a telecom network is one of aggregation. We have user equipment such as mobile phones or other wireless devices, many of them within a specific cell are connecting to a cell tower or also called a base station. Similarly, there are a lot of base stations that are distributed geographically. They in turn are aggregated and they are sent to the mobile core. The mobile core has two main components, the control plane component and the data plane component. The control plane mainly deals with user information, whether the user is a valid subscriber. If a user is moving from one cell tower to another cell tower, how does it handle the mobility in order to ensure the user does not lose connection? What are the quality of service requirements for the user? These are some of the examples of control plane section. The data plane section, as can be expected, allows the user equipment to create a connection with the internet and send packets back and forth 
with an end servo. In 5G, the SGW and PGW are combined and are call, is called a UPF or a user plane function. This UPF is the network function that we are trying to virtualize in our use case. With virtualization of network functions and with the advent of 5G, new use cases are arising, which are mainly the disaggregation of certain processing sections of the mobile core and moving them closer to the base station. This is done in order to reduce the latency, but it's also done in order to improve the uh, quality of service for the users. This concept is called multi-edge access site or MEC. What is a workload for a MEC? A single MEC site can handle around 250,000 devices with an average packet size of 500 bytes. The aggregate load, this is important for 250K devices is coming to around 10 gigabits per second or 2.5 million packets per second. So our use case is to achieve a single MEC site service level agreement, 10 GBPS, throughput requirement with the least number of resources. Now I'll explain a bit of our test setup. Our test setup has two main systems. The first is a traffic generator. The traffic generator uses a modified package gen software running on top of DPDK. On the physical side, it uses an X710 network interface card, which is a 40 gig network interface card split as four ports of 10 gig each. The traffic generator simulates access network. It simulates a bunch of cell towers. It simulates user equipment and that data is sent to the gateway. The traffic generator also simulates response packets from the internet to the user equipment. So there are two flows, there's an uplink flow and there is a downlink flow. Now coming to the system under test, we have a system under test which uses an EA10 network interface card, which is a hundred gigabit network interface card. It's split into four ports of 25 gigabits each. As I said earlier, the UPF is the network function that we are trying to work with. We virtualize this network function with the help of Docker. Now Docker is used, as I mentioned earlier, there are a couple of network virtualization modes such as L2 bridge, Mac VLAN, IP VLAN, SRIOV. For the first three, L2, Mac VLAN and IP VLAN, we use the Docker CLI commands in order to create the network as well as manage the network. The Docker CLI commands internally, they call, they use Netlink calls to create this network. In the case of SRIOV, we create the VFs up front, we spin up the container and use a software called Pipework to move the VF interface from the host namespace into the container namespace. On the, over here on the right hand side, we have the system parameters. The system under test parameters is using a Xeon Platinum 8260 CPU at 2.4 gigahertz. The Linux kernel version is 515, 23 generic. The test duration, 50 seconds. Packet size, uh, similar to the MEC workload of 500 bytes. It's the traffic generator is simulating 20 E node Bs or cell towers and 8,000 user end equipments. And the packet rate is 2.4 million packets per second, which is the limit for this uh, link. The test results that we get are as the following. On the y-axis, we have megabits per second per core on this left y-axis. On the right y-axis, we have, we use the bridge plus Linux as a baseline. And these are the percentage improvements compared to the baseline. The baseline case runs close to 200,000 packets per second. So we're using a, a bridge network virtualization and a Linux, traditional Linux network stack. This is the least performant because two reasons. One is it has high CPU overhead for doing the net filter address translations and also for doing a table lookup. As if you look at the Mac VLAN and IP VLAN, the absence of net filter lookup 
increases the performance. The SRIO V plus Linux, it's removing the network virtualization into the hardware, but as can be seen, there isn't a lot of difference compared to the solutions like Mac VLAN and IP VLAN, which shows that the main performance uh, issue is coming from the traditional network stack processing overhead, mainly the packet copy from kernel space to user space. When we eliminate the packet copy using AFXTP zero copy, we see the performance hitting 9.6 gigabits per second per core. This result allows, so if we have a MEX site and we're trying to achieve, we are trying to service a single MEX site with 10 gigabit per second load, using this solution, we would require 10 UPF instances or 10 cores in order to satisfy 2 million packets per second. But using this SRIOV and AFXTP zero copy combination, we're able to achieve it with a single core. This reduction in CPU cores helps in reducing the cost of ownership. To conclude, as I mentioned earlier, the combination of these, this solution provides a 10X performance or similar to 10, close to 10X performance compared to the others uh, in kernel solutions that they're comparing against. This helps lowering TCO because the resources required are reduced. And also because uh, since it's supported in kernel, the system integration overhead is reduced. We do not require third party integration to get the setup working. Secondly, the kernel space handles the network hardware queue programming. So there is a separation from user space and kernel space in order who deals with the network hardware. And this improves system security. And again, as I mentioned in that figure, any queue pairs that are not being used by the fast path can be used for control packet processing, such as ARP resolution. And since we are not bypassing the kernel completely, we are coordinating and cooperating with the kernel. We have access to Linux tools, such as if config, IP, et tool statistics in order to help with debugging and diagnostics. The fourth point is hardware IO virtualization removes the network, virtual, network virtualization overhead from the CPU and puts it into the hardware. This removes the bridging overhead with CPU, but also importantly, since we can create um, many VFs, we have scalability options. The future work is going to be removing it, moving it from a Docker engine into a Kubernetes orchestration framework. This becomes important once we start scaling out the network functions. The second point is an important one. We want to test the scalability and learn about any performance thresholds, what they are and what can be done to overcome them. When we deploy the network function in a Kubernetes framework, we want to reduce the privilege of permissions for the network function to run in a pod. This again helps in improving system security. And finally, we are right now, the, I, the AFXTP zero copy modification in the IAVF driver is an out of tree driver. We want to push for upstreaming this driver change into the main, Lin, main, main Linux kernel. The next two slides are just references that we used, which can be seen and can be referred to. With this, I conclude my talk. I wanna thank everyone for listening to this talk and I'm open to questions. Thank you. Thank you. That was actually a very good uh, topic. And uh, it's always nice to see how uh, infrastructure that already exists can be used and leveraged to do even better things. So uh, if there are questions, go ahead and ask them now. I can have my mic circle. <laughs> yeah, okay, so uh, you mentioned that you're using KFXDP uh, for accelerating this, but uh, in that case, you are losing the, uh, all the header constructions that's provided by the stack. So what actually uh, creates the, 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 the Ethernet frames, not only like the raw frames, but, but the whole stack thing in this solution? 
Yeah, that's a good question. So for, for the use case of uh, telecom, you generally require high fast performance and they're okay with having the user space deal with header formations, especially the ethernet header formations. But this actually does create some performance issues, uh, mainly dealing with if you're trying to send a packet out, you want to know the MAC address for your external interface, egress interface. And this MAC address exists in an op table in the Linux kernel. To get this MAC address, we have to do a netlink call. That's like two context switches, context switch in, get the value, context switch back to the user space. So it is a, an issue, but uh, we are trying to see if we can actually make use of the XTP programmability the XTP itself provides a bunch of helper functions which can interact with the kernel. We are looking into it. It would be good if we had an XTP on the TX in order to do this, but there is no XTP support on the TX. So we are looking into XTP support on the ingress on the RX, uh, which is capable of looking into the arc table and filling it over there itself to avoid, uh, to get the value of the MAC address, at least to avoid the context switches. But as you mentioned, it's not, since we are bypassing the network stack, we are losing the ethernet header constructions and we have to move it to the user space. We have a question from the bridge. Just gonna throw it up on stage. One needs to recompile the application to use XTP sockets and not an AFI net socket. Yes, uh, if if you want to, if you want to open a socket that can do AFXTP operations, it has to be opened with the AFXTP socket family. Yeah, I think it's not that you have to recompile. You have to right. your app is changing, so you have to. You, you do you do require a, a layer, so it's not it's not just as simple as using an AFI net socket where you create a socket and you just use send and receive calls and you can forget about it. There is a level of complexity mainly because we have to register a UMEM. You also have to work with the rings that I mentioned earlier in order to transfer control of the frames. So generally you'd have, you'd have a, an application logic and a shim layer in between. The shim layer would actually be dealing entirely with the AFXTP ring control and creating the sockets and human registration. But yeah, you don't need to recompile the application. You just have to open a different type of socket. Okay. Um, there's a follow-up. Handle header processing to be able to use XTP socket. So I haven't used this but I believe there is an AFXTP Paul mode driver, which allows, again, I can't be certain how this works since I never used it, but I think it, it leaves the, the DPDK application as it is, so it can use its RTE underscore uh, APIs, but underneath it's still using an AFXTP operation. So I believe it can be done using the AFXTP Paul mode driver, but I'm not too certain how it works. Nishan, somebody answered the question saying yes. Okay. Okay. I, I think I think one of those things are true. Uh, okay, we have one more. Um, more more affirmation. AFXTP PMD has been supported years ago. Um, any other simple questions? All right, uh, I guess in that case, thank you. And we'll take a slightly longer break now and meet for the last session of the day. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.